it is a bit of a mouthful, I realise, after I'd put that title in. So I'm Stephen, I'm from Newcastle. If you see me repeatedly checking my phone today, there's a rumour that exam results are coming out, so hopefully I'll be having a beer later, but we'll be finding out, I hope. So Tim put it very nicely. It's uh, trying to find little pieces of the jigsaw puzzle for CRS and trying to put those together so we get a bit better understanding. So the key bits from my talk are that it's the... Now then, how do we get this going? Transcriptome. So transcriptome just means all the RNA that's being transcribed to either produce proteins or to produce other genes that regulate genes. So genes that are being switched on at that point. And then microenvironment. So measuring exactly what's going on in the nose here in patients, because we still haven't got a particularly good understanding of what is in people's nose. So this is what we often see in the clinic, the top picture, CRS with polyps. I think we're all in agreement that surgery is the treatment there. There's some debate about how much surgery you should do, and there's been some interesting debates over this conference. There's the non-polypoid patients, which is what I'm focusing on mainly in this talk. And it looked like macrolides were going to be the answer with that. But maybe it's not quite so promising. And then there's the normal group. And I'm a registrar on training, so I haven't been around for that long. But there's a lot of patients that I see in the clinic that have a lot of symptoms. And you pop the endoscope in the nose, and there's nothing to see. And there's a lot of explanation you give to those patients. But there's nothing really that you can show them other than the picture on the telly. It'd be nice if there was a blood test like a CRP or an ESR or even something like a, a patient side uh, BM so you could measure the inflammation that's going on in their nose. But we just don't really know. So if we start with what we do know, normal healthy mucosa, ciliated respiratory epithelium, polyps have lots of edema, lots of albumin, epithelial loss, and then chronic sinusitis with, without nasal polyps, lots of inflammatory cells there fibrosis and thickening and epithelial loss. Now this is a simplification. There's some impressive work from Prof Backert's group about endotypes, but endotypes aren't really that clear yet. And they're only endotypes that you find out postoperatively when you've taken the biopsies. So that's not yet that helpful in the clinic. So this is Professor Backert's work. Um, basically, chronic rhinosinusitis is separated into without polyps and with polyps. And the key difference is in the remodeling pattern, the inflammatory pattern, or whether there's comorbid respiratory disease with the superantigens. And you hear about type 1 and type 2, and that's the type of T cell and the type of inflammatory uh, cytokines that they produce. So I'm focusing mainly on chronic sinusitis without nasal polyps. And that's Th1 inflammation and fibrosis. And that's a bit chicken and egg. Nobody really knows whether the fibrosis comes first or the inflammation comes first. So we have a big fibrosis laboratory in Newcastle, so part of it's pragmatic, so that's why I went along to them. And I took my nasal samples and said, can we go and study them? And they're interested in livers and kidneys. Uh, and I thought, how am I going to convince this man to let me study sinonasal disease? But chance was that he had chronic sinusitis. So, so he was interested. And the other reason he was interested that is one of our strengths in ENT is they're trying to get drugs delivered into the kidney and into the liver with second pass metabolism. But all of our organs in ENT, they're accessible. We can put endoscopes in, we can deliver drugs. And drug companies are something that we can exploit that a lot more than I think we do. Uh, so that's one of our strengths and we should play to it a little bit more. So the aims of my work was to isolate two key mucosal cells, the epithelial cells and the fibroblasts, and separate them from the immune cells and see, are these structural cells involved in the process? Is there any role there? then measure exactly what's going on in the nose. So bring it back to the patient. It's very easy when you're doing laboratory work to get far away from the patient and start studying genes and proteins, and it actually has no relevance to what's going on in the clinic. And then you can try and relate that back into your, your cellular experiments. And then to compare the transcriptome, so all the RNA transcripts that are being switched on in people without nasal polyps and those that are controls. So these were NHS patients that were very tightly phenotyped. Those without polyps, their smoking status, their allergic status, whether they were on steroids, other medications, um, and just undergoing normal NHS procedures. Um, and then also in Newcastle, I was fortunate that there's a significant skull base and pituitary program. So they formed the normal controls. So the non-functioning pituitary patients, not <coughs> patients with lots of uh, corticosteroid going around. 
So from each of those patients took a biopsy, took a biopsy to have a look at the epithelium so that you can characterize what's going on. And then also so you've got tissue stored so there's a lot more laboratory techniques you can do with it. And then from each of those patients grow epithelial cells and fibroblasts so you can separate them from everything else that's going on here just to isolate what those bits are in patient-derived cells, not cell lines. And then using a number of transcriptome techniques, not just one, so microarrays and uh, sequencing to see if there's any difference there. And then this is what we did to measure the snot. So this is borrowed from the lower airways. Uh, it's putting a piece of filter paper in the nose with a nose clip on for a few minutes and then extracting that and then looking at what mediators are there. So it's the rhinological snot 22. So all the nose symptoms from there, all the sleep quality of life are taken out, significantly different and significantly different on the scan. What's interesting there is, it's going a bit off topic, but the, the controls have still got reasonable scores there, and you know from the endoscope, the CT scan, and they're not patients with sinusitis, but that's a question for another day. When you look down the electron microscope at control patients, you see these nice epithelial cells, healthy cilia, and to me it looks a bit like the bottom of the ocean with sea anemones. So it's not that surprising that saltwater irrigation helps. If you look at patients with out nasal polyps, where have the cilia gone and where are the epithelial cells? Well, these are the epithelial cells and they're the remnants of the cilia. So it's not surprising that their mucosa doesn't work very well. But why is that? So we grew out the epithelial cells, confirmed that we were looking at epithelial cells and the same with the fibroblasts, which to me, they look like fried eggs, but uh, maybe that's just me. Confirmed they were exactly what they were and then sequenced their RNA. And much to my surprise, from two separate techniques, the epithelial cells didn't show any significant difference in the genes that were transcribed. Now, there's complicated statistics involved there, but that, that really wasn't what I was expecting at all. And then the fibroblast cells had quite different inflammatory profile and different genes between normal and diseased patients. But that didn't mirror in any way their parent tissues. So I was a bit stumped at that point but a number of boards gone up, so uh, that's a whole separate talk for another day. So coming back to the patient, uh, this is perhaps one of the minor aims of my thesis, but it became more interesting. So when you measure what's going on in the nose of healthy controls and sinus patients, we found 13 mediators that were differentially expressed through a range of chemokines, cytokines, angiogenesis markers, and vascular injury markers. And then if you correlate those with the rhinological subscale parts of the SNOT22, they're all significantly correlated. And that's protein in a piece of tissue just put on someone's nose in the clinic. And then if you take biopsies from the patients, extract the RNA and look at the genes, the genes are upregulated as well. But you might say, so what? You've measured inflammation in the nose, in protein, in biopsies, in patients that you know have got inflammation. But actually that's a step forward because You've measured inflammation in these patients' nose. There's a scale that you can measure it on, and, and that is moving towards biomarkers. And then more than that, if you look at the tissue, you can see that there's a difference between the tissue. If you look at the fibroblasts, there's a difference in the chemokines that they produce. So actually, are these structural fibroblast cells recruiting some of these immune cells that drive the inflammation? That's another chicken and egg question that I'm not gonna be able to answer but there was no difference in the epithelial cells. So in conclusion, my hypothesis was nothing like the work I ended up doing. So um, that was a bit frustrating, but there was one professor that told me, don't fall in love with your hypothesis. And uh, actually it's just a guess, I guess. So I, I learned more in the process of finding out that my hypothesis was wrong and then looking at something else. So here we've demonstrated a non-invasive measure of the cytokine profile. We've got a panel of 13 markers that show greater expression in non-polypoid CRS, and they all correlate with the rhinological subscale of SNOT22. So that's potentially moving towards biomarkers that might be helpful in endotyping patients non-invasively. And then I have a massive database of microarrays and RNA sequencing data that I'm still trying to make sense of. But the data that you get from this is only as good as the samples that you put in at the beginning. So I think we need a lot more work on the characterization of these patients so that all these sorts of powerful tools, we know exactly what we're looking at, so we're comparing apples, oranges, and bananas appropriately. And I think that might be along the lines of what Professor Wilson might talk a little bit about with her 
precision medicine. She's shaking her head. She's not going to be talking about that. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.